If you're new to my channel, you may not know that I do a series of retrospectives where I go through a console's library and pick out all the notable titles. It's my favorite thing to do as a collector. And today's review is something that is really in line with that. Thanks to SNK for sending me a code to check out the SNK 40th Anniversary Collection, which comes out next week. Though they're best known for their Neo Geo titles and have put out quite a few collections of those, they've done something completely different this time. So check out part one of my review of the SNK 40th Anniversary Collection. So what's on here? This is a collection of their NES and arcade releases from before the Neo Geo was around. It's basically the SNK 80s collection, and kind of includes most of the games the company developed between 1980 and 1990. I'll start by saying it's an impressive collection, but with some big caveats. The Switch game card includes 11 different arcade titles, 6 NES versions of those arcade titles, and 2 NES exclusives. Unless it was an international release, each arcade game includes both the North American and Japanese versions. While most of them only feature minor differences outside of the title screens, it's a nice touch. NES games included also feature both the North American NES versions and the Japanese Famicom versions of the game. Again, there's not really many major differences, but it's cool to see the different versions. There's also going to be 11 more arcade games added as free download, so we'll get to those later. Before we get into the games, the title screen features two other options. One is the very cool museum mode, which walks you through SNK's entire catalog through the 80s. It's a good look from the source at all the arcade and NES games the company put out basically before they moved on to the Neo Geo. The museum mode contains two other options. First is an extra section with ads, concept art, newsletter, and Japanese arcade guide scans. Just a ton of cool stuff in here. I do wish they had the NES manual scanned in here too, but what's in here is great and something that all collections should aspire to. Second is a music player where you can listen to the soundtracks of all of the games except for Vanguard and Iron Tank. Into the games menu itself, it lists all of the games. You can press X on any game to switch the region from North American to Japanese. And if a game has both an arcade and NES version, when you select it, you can choose to go into the arcade or the NES versions and then you can still use the X button to switch regions between those. For each game on the menu, you can also press Y to access game options. Arcade games allow you to change the starting lives, difficulty, and sometimes other features like friendly fire or blood. After choosing your game and platform, you get the new game, watch, and continue options. New game starts the game, continue loads your save, and for the versions of the game that have the watch option, which is usually the arcade version unless it's an NES only game, you can watch a video of a pro playthrough of the game. These are really impressive to see, and if you get stuck in a game, you can see how to get through a section, though it's not that easy to replicate what those players are doing. I do wish there were some game overviews in here, something to introduce the game, controls, objectives, and power-ups, that kind of stuff. There's a listing of controls under the options menu, but I think they could have done a bit better there. The emulation for the games was done by Digital Eclipse, who are fairly highly regarded for their emulation quality. And the collection likely benefits from their Eclipse emulation engine, and experience with other titles like the original Mega Man Legacy Collection, the Disney Afternoon Collection, and the recent Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection. Now I'm no digital foundry, and I haven't played the arcade versions of these games on original hardware, but for the most part it all seems to run well. I'll get into the few issues I did encounter as I talk about each game later, but overall it seems good, and the NES emulation seems to be on point based on my past experience with the NES games. In-game, each game version has one save slot. You can access the menu at any time by pressing the minus button. Here you can access the save or load game options. Your display options are also here. There's three different zoom modes, you can turn off and on the background image, and there's three filter options, none, monitor, or TV. Most of my footage here uses the no filter, background off, and biggest zoom mode that doesn't stretch the game, but you can use the other options if you prefer the scan lines look. You can also turn the switch screen vertically, which is reflected in many of the vertically oriented arcade games to get more of a full screen look when playing off TV. This makes me wish the flip grip was already out, since it'd be the best way to play more of these games in handheld mode, so consider looking into that if you play most games in handheld or tablet modes. Another big feature, to ensure you have the chance to complete all of these quarter munching arcade games, is the rewind feature. You can hold the L button at any time during gameplay to rewind the game, allowing you to correct mistakes. In some cases, over and over until you're out of a tough situation. Some of these arcade games have really tough sections, so you'll be thankful for it. You can rewind for about 5 minutes of gameplay, so you should be good for any situation you get yourself into. 
One issue I have with the rewind feature is that it seems to be some cases where it stops working when switching between games. I experienced this a couple times, and in each case it just stopped working for NES games until I restarted the game. NIST PR has put out a release saying that a day one patch will fix that issue, so we'll see. Getting into the game control options, you can use both Joy-Cons or the Pro Controller. Many of the arcade games were released using SNK's rotary joysticks, or as they call them, the loop levers. I've never had the chance to see these in arcades, but always understood that they were joysticks that rotated and which turned your character, so you could use your regular joystick motion to move your character and rotate or spin the joystick to change the angle your character faces and shoot in that direction. It's an interesting way to allow distinct movement and shooting, different from something like Robotron's twin stick controls. Without a special peripheral, it's impossible to recreate this controller feel which is why most NES ports of these games just have the character facing the direction they're moving. But that really changes the intended design of the games. So Digital Eclipse went with a twin stick shooter scheme. The left stick moves your character, and the right stick aims in the direction pressed while the trigger shoots. While it's a bit more complicated than a modern twin stick shooter, it supposedly makes the games much easier than the original arcade controls. The big downside to this is that you can't play any of the games with a single Joy-Con. That means if you have your Switch on the go and only have two Joy-Cons, you can't play two players at the moment. NISPR also put out a statement saying that on day one a patch will allow new control options which will address that issue. I'm going to take a look at that patch when it's out and do an update to this review, so we'll see how that is. Okay, finally, let's get into the individual games. I'm going to go through these in chronological order, starting with Vanguard, which came out in 1981. This is the international arcade version. This is a really interesting early shoot 'em up that scrolls in multiple directions. Visually it's rough, but for 1981 it was a really impressive title. You have a mini-map of the game that shows the areas you're moving through, and it scrolls horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. The game goes through six pretty distinct areas and ends in a boss battle before looping to a higher difficulty level. The game has four buttons that shoot in four different directions, so movement is separate from shooting. It's kind of an early approach to the rotary joystick stuff, which we'll get to later. Other notable aspects of the game are fairly generous checkpoints, voice samples that play, and an invincibility power-up. Following that is TNK3, or just Tank as it's known in Japan. From 1985, this includes both the Japanese and American arcade releases. This is SNK's first top-down tank shooter, which inspires a lot of their games moving forward. It's also the first game to feature their rotary joystick. The controls here do take some getting used to. You can fire the tank guns or cannon. The cannon can be rotated with the right stick, but the guns always fire in the direction the tank is pointed. This is basically the first game in the Akari Warrior series as well, as the tank is apparently being driven by Ralph or Paul from Akari Warriors. Though it's not really mentioned here, it is confirmed by Iron Tank. Following that we get the arcade, NES, and Famicom versions of Alpha Mission or ASO, Armored Scrum Object as it's known in Japan. This is a vertical shoot 'em up where you fire your guns to take out flying enemies or use missiles to hit ground targets. This game is one of the first, this is one of the first games in which SNK focuses heavily on power-ups. The gameplay loop is to keep getting power-ups while staying alive until you're super powerful. A design concept we'll see in a lot of the games coming up. Power-ups increase your speed, shot, and missile power, and lets you collect pieces of the eight different power armors. Once you get all three pieces of an armor, you can equip it, and you can bank the armors you've collected so far so you can hold off till you need them. Choosing an armor is kind of annoying. A selector at the bottom of the screen moves as your ship does, so you have to be cautious of where you're flying when you're trying to select the one you want. The NES and Famicom ports here are okay to check out. There's a lot of slowdown like any NES game where there's so much happening on the screen at once, but one improvement is that you can press the select button to bring up a menu which pauses the game so you can select the armor you want to equip next. Moving on to 1986, we get Akari Warriors, the first game in the trilogy, it includes both the arcade versions and the NES and Famicom ports. This is the first game we've talked about with simultaneous two-player gameplay. Other games had two-player modes, but the players took turns like Mario Brothers. Thankfully, you can turn off the friendly fire because that is just not fun in this frantic a game. The arcade version of SNK's top-down action shooter is a bit more janky than I expected. I had some issues with the performance, and I'm curious if the original arcade game also had those. There's slowdown at times, and strangely, in some cases when too much is going on and one player is in a tank, the other player's shoot button doesn't work for a couple seconds at a time, so that surprised me. The game is a top-down shooter, clearly inspired by Tank. This time you control Ralph and Clark, or Vince and Paul as they're known in the English versions. They're two soldiers who move through a battlefield shooting and tossing grenades at enemies. You can move and shoot in different directions, and you can also get in tanks that you find throughout the game, until they take too much damage, that is. One thing I noticed here is that the American version seemed to have a lot more tanks, or at least different tank placement than the Japanese one. 
You also have limited ammo and grenades, and need to get pickups in order to replenish ammo, or you won't be able to attack anymore. The NES and Famicom versions are just basic ports that get the job done, but isn't really that great. With the lack of the rotary stick, you just shoot in the direction you're facing, and when you're in a tank, you have to rotate the turret separately by holding the B button while using the D-pad. Following that we get the 1986 action platformer Athena which includes the international arcade release and the NES Famicom ports. This is definitely worth checking out. I would played the NES one before but was a bit underwhelmed, but the arcade one is really nice looking with some really interesting gameplay mechanics for the genre. Taking inspiration from the design mechanics of Alpha Mission, the game has a heavy focus on powering up your character throughout the game. Your main goal is to break blocks throughout the stages to find power ups which increase your stats and then find better weapons and armor to use. The game is really tough though. So if you're not powered enough for tougher areas or for the bosses, you won't have a chance. Even Rewind can't help you that much there. And the game has a time limit, so you gotta be quick with getting your power-ups and getting through the stage. The game design can be really frustrating with constantly respawning enemies, tough projectile patterns, and auto-targeting enemy attacks, which is one complaint I have against it. It also features multiple paths and warps through the game, giving you more to check out than a single playthrough. The NES and Famicom versions aren't that bad, but interesting to see and compare against the original version. First off, the opening animation makes no sense, so it's cool to see the arcade version to know what it was trying to show. These versions also feature the typical early NES jank. They tried to stay true to the experience, but couldn't really spawn as much on screen at a time. If the design was a bit more polished, I could see this NES game standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Wonder Boy games, but it's just not quite there. Following that, Victory Road Ikari Warriors 2. With both arcade and console versions on here, it's a really strange follow-up to Ikari Warriors, which features similar gameplay, but instead takes place in an apocalyptic future where the world is being attacked by alien invaders. There's different weapons here, weird enemies, and interesting warps, but the arcade version feels a bit more off than I expected. It's a crazy game to see and worth checking out. Another big change to the game is that instead of tanks, you have power armor you get into, and there's a sword weapon you can pick up to use for melee attacks. The NES version is a decent port, and they even add in stats that you can increase with power-ups and the ability to switch between weapons which you've collected ammo for. But one thing that's interesting here is I think the Famicom version runs quite a bit worse than the NES one. Next up is Psycho Soldier from 1987. Here we get both the Japanese and English versions of the arcade game, which is one I was hyped to try out since I never really played it before or didn't really know much about it, other than it features the descendant of Athena, who's also a character in King of Fighters. As a follow-up to Athena, you play a modern-day schoolgirl descendant, who's also a pop idol that's fighting off an alien invasion. But the gameplay is a bit bland. It's a forward-scrolling action platformer where you jump and drop between four levels of platforms, always moving forward and trying to get to the end of the stage to defeat the boss. Along the way you can break blocks to find power-ups like Athena, but they're less varied. You can basically raise your energy, get defensive orb, and change your attack up a bit, but your energy gets used up so you have to keep replenishing it and watching for bad pickups to drain it. You can also play two players simultaneously with player two controlling Athena's friend. Overall it's an easier game than the other arcade titles, with only some tough parts in the last level. One notable thing about the game is that as a pop idol, Athena's song with vocals plays throughout the game. You're going to want to play the Japanese version here because it's actually decent in that one. The English version is about what you'd expect from a late 80s dubbed Japanese song. Next up is Guerrilla War. This includes both the arcade versions and the NES and Famicom versions. This is a cool top-down shooter that takes the gameplay of Akari Warriors and drops in historical figures Fidel Castro and Che Guevara as playable characters and is kind of based on Cuba's Revolutionary War. 
Like Ikari Warriors, you move and aim separately and you can get into tanks. It's actually a pretty funny visual to see how Che and Fidel look in the tanks. Updates to the Ikari Warriors formula is the bigger focus on blowing up barriers with grenades to proceed, and there's now hostages you can rescue for extra points if you don't accidentally kill them first. The NES and Famicom versions show that SNK is getting better at developing for the platform and is a much better experience than the previous ports. It's also much faster than the arcade for a different game experience. Next up is Iron Tank, The Invasion of Normandy or Great Tank in Japan. This is the first NES and Famicom exclusive that's on here, and it's a really interesting remake of Tank which we talked about earlier. While the controls are simplified to work on the NES, the gameplay is expanded in a number of ways, adding basic RPG features to make it a whole different experience. The game features NPCs that you can talk to, radio calls that give you hints, branching paths to add replayability, and pickups including four different types of ammo you can switch between. It's just as tough as an arcade shooter, especially with how you have to rotate the turret the same way Akari Warriors on the NES handled it, but it does stand out among the NES titles. Following that, we get both the arcade versions and NES slash Famicom versions of POW, Prisoners of War. I loved the NES game as a kid, so I was excited to see what the arcade version was like. And it's alright! It's a decent beat-em-up with quite a few attack options, including punches, back punches, kicks, a headbutt, and jumps. You can also pick up guns and knives that enemies drop for temporary use, but I don't think you can drop the gun when you're out of ammo. You can still use it to hit enemies, but you can't do your other attacks, so it really limits your options. As far as I've tried, you have to be hit to drop it. You can also play this two-player simultaneously. It's colorful with big sprites and overall still fun, but I'm actually not sure if I like it more than the NES version. That might just be nostalgia talking, but the NES version still holds up. It's only one player, but the controls are streamlined and the gameplay feels smoother, despite the obvious graphical drop. Also, the gun drops automatically when you're out of bullets, so there's that. Ikari Warriors 3 The Rescue is next from 1989. The last Ikari Warriors game is one I was interested to see the arcade version of, being familiar with the NES one. Both the arcade versions, NES and Famicom versions, are here. Akari 3 The Rescue brings Ralph and Clark back to the modern world, and while it's still a top-down action game, the focus is now on melee combat. Enemies rush in and you take them out with punches and kicks. You can move from the water to land and that changes up your attacks. You can only punch and backhand in the water, but on land you can also jump and kick. There's still guns to pick up and use, but you'll mostly be attacking with your fists and feet. Actually, it's not quite a top-down game. It's more of a three-quarters view with sprites that make it a bit awkward mostly because the camera is so tight. Your sprites are huge, and you can't really see what's coming at you since enemies are already so close to you by the time they enter the screen. Because of that, it's great the NES version is included. And again, this might be nostalgia talking, but it may be the better game. It's at least a pretty different experience. And because the focus is on melee now, it controls better than the other Akari and tank ports. Because of the sprite limitations, it is a top-down game, and you can see quite a bit further around you. In fact, the NES version feels more like a follow-up to the previous Akari games than the arcade version does. Prehistoric Isle in 1930 is a game I'd never heard of, but man am I glad it's on this collection because it is such a nice surprise and one of the must plays here. Both the North American and Japanese arcade versions are on here, and it's a very fun and colorful horizontal shoot 'em up where you fly planes through an island full of dinosaurs, cavemen, and other creatures that assault you from all directions. The power up system is pretty unique here as well. You get a pod similar to R Type's option, which you can rotate around your ship. Depending on where you position it, it'll do a different kind of shot. There are basically eight different attacks, and they all get stronger as you collect more power-ups. You can play this simultaneously, two players, and it's just its such a good-looking game, such a fun game, definitely worth checking out. Following that, the last arcade game, and maybe the least, is Street Smart, which includes the English and Japanese arcade versions. This is an arcade-only fighting game that plays a lot like a beat-em-up. You move around like a beat-em-up and have fairly limited ways to attack. You can fight one player against a CPU opponent, or two players against two opponents. In between those matches, player one can fight against player two. It's interesting as an early fighter, and looks pretty good for the time, but it is just really basic. Your opponents take so much damage, it feels really repetitive. Finally, the last game on here is the NES exclusive Crystallis, or as the Famicom version was known, God Slayer. I bet you can guess why they changed that name. This is one of the best action RPGs on the console, and the one SNK game I still have in my collection complete in box. Overall, it's a top-down action RPG. It feels kind of inspired by East. Although it's a fantasy world, it takes place long after an advanced civilization was wiped out. 
There's multiple swords, shields, armor, magic spells, elements, and items to find or buy that help you get through the game's overworld, dungeons, and puzzles. You also get XP and gold for killing monsters, and you can level up which increases your stats. For combat, you can do a basic attack with your sword, or you can power up to launch a projectile attack. As you progress through the game, you can power it up more times for even bigger, stronger attacks. Definitely one of the must-plays of the collection, though also the hardest game to play the Japanese version in this collection, and one of the best NES games overall, so definitely check this out. So in total, you're getting 19 games on the card at release, with both Japanese and English versions. And there's going to be 11 other arcade games after launch, so there's a total of 30 games you get for buying this collection. So let's talk about those additional games and what's coming. On launch, the day one patch should be up, and that's supposed to include new control options, fixing my biggest complaint, as well as a number of other bug fixes. On December 11th, a game update will be available which adds 9 arcade games to the collection, including Ozama Wars, Sasuke vs. Commander, Fantasy, Mobile Munch or Joyful Road as it's known, Bermuda Triangle, World Wars, Time Soldiers, Paddle Mania, and Chopper 1. Also on December 11th, a piece of free DLC will be added to the eShop, which adds the games Beast Busters and SAR Search and Rescue. I guess those games are bigger and can't be released through a regular game update. Once the day one patch is out, which I think is still supposed to be before release date, I'm going to do a part two to this review that goes through that patch and all of these games that are going to be added later in more detail, so check back for that. Overall, the SNK 40th Anniversary Collection is a great package. It's just a shame that it's likely being rushed out in time for a holiday season where the Switch doesn't have much, when it's clearly not the full package they intended. That's something that really gets me as a physical collector who cares about having everything essential to a game on its physical media at the time of release, but overall it's a solid enough package for me to look past that. And with the 11 free games coming, it does end up being an amazing example of what a collection should be that celebrates a developer's history, putting out titles that are not easily available and some that are mostly unknown or forgotten in this day. It does feel like a celebration of SNK, and really showcases their best work from before their most popular era with the Neo Geo, which itself is still pretty niche. While the individual titles vary on how much you'll get out of them, everything is worth checking out, and the rewind feature makes it not too painful to get through a full playthrough of at least one version of each of the games. And I'd say that the best stuff on here is worth playing multiple times through. So if you're into retro titles, this is a collection worth checking out. It comes out on November 13th. So thanks for checking out this review. Let me know your thoughts about the game in the comments, and subscribe and stay tuned for part 2 where I'm going to go through all the DLC titles, the day one patch, and maybe let you know some games that I think should be on here that aren't. I'll see you guys later.